Well, Happy New Year, everybody. It's good to see you. Good to be back with you. Hope you all had a good Christmas. Hope you had a good New Year. Uh, we had a good time seeing our family and visiting our family and got back safe, so we're thankful for that. I appreciate Pastor Cameron uh, filling in, doing, doing so much, and uh, I know he filled in last Wednesday when Joe was sick, and Joe's getting better. I talked to Joe this week, but he's not there yet, but he's getting there, so. But I'm glad to be back with you guys, and good to see y'all, and, and uh, glad to be here. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 1 is where we're going to be tonight, uh, Joshua chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I want to share a verse with you. You know, as people enter a new year, so many people are anxious in our society as we start 2024, and they're worried about so many things, especially, you know, what's happening over with Israel and Hamas and everything, and, and the, the Ukraine, and then, you know, all sorts of stuff going on in this country. People are just full of anxiety. People are full of worry. But as a Christian, I want to remind you what God's Word said from Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Paul writes this, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, is, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. These things which you have learned and received and heard and saw me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You know, as a Christian, we don't have to live in anxiety and worry because Jesus is our Prince of Peace. And here Paul reminds us that there's nothing we should be anxious for. We shouldn't have to worry about anything. Instead, we take our anxieties, we take our worries, and we bring them to God in prayer. It says bring everything in prayer to God and do it with thanksgiving because you know that God's going to hear us and God's going to answer our prayers according to his perfect will. And when we turn over our anxieties and our worries to him, he gives us his peace. And it's that peace that oftentimes you hear me say, the peace that surpasses all understanding. And this is the passage I get it from. It doesn't make sense to anybody else, but it makes sense to the believer because God gives us that peace. And he says that peace is going to guard our hearts. It's going to guard our minds from future worries. So instead of focusing on worry, instead of focusing on anxieties, in verse 8, he tells us the things we should be meditating on. And he lists all those things, that, you know, things that are true and noble and, and so forth and so on. He says, meditate on these things. And when you meditate on those things and the things of God, God, the God of peace is going to be with you because your focus is where it needs to be. So as we begin 2024, I know we're a couple of days into it now. You know, we don't know what this year is going to hold. We never do, but God does. And there's no reason for us as Christians to be worrisome, to be anxious about this uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future. Because God is sovereign, God's in control. And he's the one who floods our life with peace. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you are the God of all peace. And true, lasting peace comes from you. We don't have to be like the majority of people in this world that deal with anxiety and worries and just let that consume us. But you tell us clearly here in your word to bring them to you in prayer, and to do it with an attitude of thanksgiving, knowing that you're going to hear us, knowing that you're going to answer according to your perfect will, in your perfect timing. And when we give these over to you, you give us your peace, a peace that doesn't make sense to the world around us, but that's okay, because we don't have to make sense to them. But Father, we're thankful for the peace you do bring to our lives with the different anxieties and worries that we give to you. So help us this year to not be controlled by our worries, not be controlled by the anxieties in our life, but instead to meditate on the things that Paul mentions there in verse 8, but also just the other things all throughout Scripture, the things above, the things of God, to have the mind of Christ that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. And Lord, as, you do, as we do that, we know that you will be with us and continue to flood our soul with peace. So thank you that we can begin a new year with peace. As we look into your word tonight, talking about being successful in this new year, may you just challenge us and grow us to be more Christ-like. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, this is a New Year's message, and Sunday is going to be a New Year's message as we kick off the new year. But uh, I want to begin by asking you a question. It's not rhetorical, so that means you've got to give me some answers, okay? You ready? I know I didn't give you any warning this time, but here it is. What are people looking for? What are people expecting in 2024? Not you necessarily, but anybody. What are some things they're looking for? What are things they're expecting? Okay, we've got an election coming up, so, yep. What else? Okay. I mean, I might get one, I'm just saying. You were hoping you'd get a tax return, but yeah, so. So, yep. What else are people looking forward to and expecting in 2024? 
Okay. Change any any particular change or just change in general? Okay. All right. You know, a lot of people think, you know, change, getting a new job or, or getting in shape or losing weight or whatever it is may be, you know. So what else are some things that people look for? Y'all just going to begin. I'm sorry, go ahead. What? Better economy. Better economy. All right, good. World peace. World peace. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. People are looking for Jesus coming back. Good. Yeah. Good. Or you think about things like, you know, people want to give things up, like uh, smoking or, or whatever it is. You feel some kind of bad habit they want to give up to be healthier or whatever. Or, you know, you have a, a young couple and the, and the girl's looking to forward to getting engaged or, or if they're engaged, looking forward to getting married. There's all sorts of things people are looking for. But a big thing that people look for in a new year is success. People want to be successful. No one enters a new year and says, you know what, I want to be a complete failure. I've never met anybody that wants to, uh, says that. They may act that way, but they don't say that, you know. People want to be successful. A lot of people want to be successful, but, but here's the question I have. By what definition of success? The world's definition of success or God's definition of success? God wants us to be successful. Of course, it's by his definition of success. So here in Joshua chapter 1, he tells us that definition of success, but he tells us how to be successful. So let's look at the first nine verses here of Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord, Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, and you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness... <coughs> Excuse me. In this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law of which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God commanded the people of Israel to enter the promised land, the land of Canaan, you know, and take it as their own. This is the, the promise he gave their fathers years ago before they blew it. Remember what happened? They rebelled against God, said, no, you know, we don't trust you, God. We're going to do it our way. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The 40 years is now up. Many of, many of the people of that gen, all the generations except for, uh, of that generation except for Joshua and Caleb died off. And then now this next generation is coming up. Moses even died off. And now Joshua has stepped into the shoes of Moses to be the leader of Israel and to be in charge and to bring the people into the promised land. Now this, in, in, in my mind, is one of the greatest speeches ever given in history. And of course it's given by God himself. It has to do with what he talks about here. He talks about how being successful and prosperous by God's definition. God promises Joshua success. He promises him prosperity. And you think about it, as we enter New Year, that's what a lot of people want. They want to be successful. They want to be prosperous. But they want to do it by the world's definition. God wants us to be successful in his eyes, by his definition. I mean, if you go on Amazon today and, and just search for a book on how to be successful, there's tens of thousands of books out there how to be successful. It's a very popular topic. Everybody wants to know the secret of success. Well, in this chapter, God gives us the secret to his success, his definition. And he tells us how to be successful his way and be pleasing in his eyes. So if we want to be successful and be pleasing to God in 2024, here's some things we do that. So how do we do that? Let me give you three, three actions or three steps to do that. First, we need to stay in proper fellowship with God. 
If we want to be successful in this year, we've got to stay in proper fellowship with God. Joshua had some pretty big shoes to fill, didn't he? I mean, he, we found out immediately, you know, that he's taking the role. Look again at verses 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, and you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Well, obviously, Joshua already knew Moses was dead. Was dead. This is not news to Joshua. So why did God remind him of this fact that Moses was dead? Now remember who Joshua is following. He's not just following this any average leader. He's following a legend, if you will, if you want to think about it. Moses is, is one of the most revered figure in Judaism. I mean, think about this Moses legacy. I mean, he, he was like a security blanket for the people of Israel those 40 years in the wilderness, wasn't he? He kept them together. He led them where they needed to go. He watched out for them. But think about where he brought them from. He led an entire nation that had been in slavery for over 400 years into freedom. God used him to part the Red Sea. Remember the staff in his hand? He parted the Red Sea with that staff. God, he could call out to God, and God would pour down bread down from heaven to feed the people. Moses had a relationship with God like no one else did. And a statement is made about Moses that's not made about anybody else in all of Scripture. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, it says this, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Moses had a very close fellowship with Almighty God. And the one thing that Moses, this great man, this prophet, this leader had is the same thing that Joshua would need to be successful. He would need to have proper fellowship with God. Now look at verse 5. God says, as I was with, with, as I, excuse me, as I was with Moses, if I can say it right, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. God is promising Joshua the same thing he gave Moses. He promised him intimate fellowship to be successful. If God is with us and we have this proper fellowship, this intimate, uh, this intimate fellowship with God, God is going to lead us. God is going to guide us into what he wants us to do. And we will be successful in his eyes. Not what we want to do, not what the world says we should do, not what someone else says we do, but if we're following God's leadership, this is what God wants us to do. And God wanted Joshua to understand that, look, it's not the size of the man in the fight, but it's the size of the God and the man that matters. That's what matters, is that God is with us. If we've been successful, we've got to maintain proper fellowship with God. You know, the same God that promised that he would be with Moses, the same God that promised that he would be with Joshua, is the same God that has promised that he will be with you and me as well. And God does not change. However, we've got to make sure we're maintaining that proper fellowship. In 1 John, chapter, I mean, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, it says this, If we say that we have fellowship with him, and we walk in darkness, we lie, we do not practice the truth. So we say, hey, we're in close fellowship with God, but we have a bunch of sin in our life. We're walking in darkness, and we're, and we're dealing with unconfessed sin. We don't have proper fellowship with God. We may have a relationship with God, but sin breaks fellowship with God. So if we're harboring unconfessed sin in our life, we're not maintaining that proper fellowship with God. But I love a few verses later in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've got to stay confessed up to maintain proper fellowship with God. I mean, we're not going to live a sinless life until we get to heaven. We're still going to sin. We all know that. But we've got to make sure that when we do, we immediately confess and repent of that and get right with God so we can maintain that proper fellowship. God is with us wherever we go. And if we enjoy that presence, if we enjoy that fellowship, we're going to be successful because we're going to follow his leading, follow his guidance, follow what his will is for our lives. But here's a second way to help us be successful in 2024. Number two, obey God's word. We see that in this passage of scripture as well. You know, this is part of God's instructions to Joshua that's kind of really amazing to me. It says that the key to success is found in how we relate to God's word. Look at verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. God tells Joshua that if he would simply do what the word of God tells him to do, he'll be successful. He will be successful. And then he reinforces it there in verse 8. He says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but, it shall, but, you, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You know, it's absolutely one of the boldest, this is, this is one of the boldest promises in the entire Bible to me. I mean, it, it, it just, 
affects us so much. If we just get into God's Word and we live by God's Word, we obey God's Word, God is going to make our life successful. doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. We know that. Because we know living for the Lord and obeying God's Word is not always easy. And it's getting more and more difficult in the society we live in. But, you know, today, you know, people think, well, I'll be successful by the position I hold. I'll be successful by being famous. I'll be successful by having so much money or the possessions or whatever. You know, that's not what that word success means here. In the Hebrew language, the word success simply means this, to do what is right. Remember, it's God's definition of success. To do what God says is right. In other words, we obey the word of God. Success comes from obeying God's word. In God's eyes, you know, the way that we respond to his word determines whether we're going to be a failure or whether we're going to be successful. Notice how specific God gets in telling both Joshua and us what we're to do with his word to, in order to make sure we're successful. He says, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. So what's that mean? We've got to be in the word of God. We've got to be ingested into our lives. We've got to be digested into our lives. And so much so that it is constantly on our mind. And so much so that we're speaking the Word of God. We're sharing the Word of God. I mean, think about, you know, we just had all these bowl games, you know, with college football. Super Bowl is coming up in several weeks, you know. A lot of people are talking football, 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 you know. I don't even remember who won the Super Bowl last, the last Super Bowl. I don't even know who was in the game. Those things don't last. But friend, when you get into God's Word and God's Word gets into you, that's what lasts. That's what brings change to your life. And we should not, I'm not saying it's wrong to talk about football. Just don't talk about it all the time. We should be sharing God's Word so God's Word can change people's lives, bring lasting change to people's lives. And then he goes on to say, you shall meditate in it day and night. That word meditate is, some of y'all know this, it's the image of the cow chewing the cud. Just over and over and over and over again. You see, we're not just to read the Bible and walk away. It's not just you go in the morning, you have your quiet time, you walk away and you forget about it. That's not meditating on God's Word. And really, you kind of just wasted your time, you know. But the idea of meditating it is that we run it through our mind throughout the day. We run it through our hearts throughout the day. So much so that it just changes us to be more Christ-like. It changes the way we look at things. It changes our perspective that we look at it from God's perspective. You know, think about the day and age we, we live in. We, we want everything right now, don't we? You know, we, we, we are so impatient, we can't wait for anything, you know? We want it all right now. Even cooking food in the microwave, it's just not fast enough. You know, we want it now. You go through the drive through line. By the time you order, you think your, your order's supposed to be ready at the window. And sometimes it is, but it's not really tasting all like it, it's fresh, you know? We want everything right now. But when you meditate on God's Word, it doesn't come that easy. You've got to consider it and think about it and roll it over your mind throughout the day, throughout the week. But when you do, it changes how you think, it changes how you behave, it changes how you react, it changes your desires. It doesn't happen overnight. And you're never wasting your time when you're meditating on God's Word because it brings change into your life. Someone once said it this way, a mind that is filled with the Word of God leads to a heart that is full of the love of God and a life that is lived in the wisdom of God. That's a pretty good way to say it. And then he says this, observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your ways prosperous, and then you will have good success. God wants us to be successful in obeying His Word. He doesn't say, I'm going to make it so difficult they can't do it. He wants us to be successful in obeying His Word. It's important to read the, the Word of God. It's important to memorize the Word of God. It's important to meditate on the Word of God. But all that is useless if we don't obey it. We're just checking our little spiritual box and getting our gold star for the day. But until we put action to it, it's useless. We need to obey it. And the proof that, the really, that we believe the Bible is that we obey the Bible. How many Christians say, yeah, I believe the Bible is God's Word, but it has no, no change, no impact in their life whatsoever. And when the Bible really, you know, we believe the Bible, we begin to obey it, it's like it comes alive to us. And it changes us. And we see God fulfilling His Word. We see God fulfilling His promises. And we follow God's Word, and we do what God's Word says. The God of the Word makes us successful. And then remember again what he says in verse 7 when he says this to Joshua. Observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. We're to believe what this book teaches. We're to live according to what this book teaches. And we're to live those beliefs out in our lives. And the more of this book that we believe, the more that we obey, the more successful we will be by God's definition of success. 
Now, there's one more way to be successful he gives us here. Number three, live out God's purpose for your life. Live out God's purpose. You know, God had made a promise to the nation of Israel. God had promised the promised land. That's where the word comes from. I promise you this land. But, you know, they needed someone to lead them. They needed someone to, to, to make that cross over the Jordan and lead them into the promised land. So Joshua was about to find out what his purpose, why he was put on this earth for. Look again at verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land which, uh, the, an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. You just, we just read Joshua's purpose, is that he was supposed to step in the shoes after Moses and lead the people of Israel. This was his calling. This was what he was born to do. This was God's purpose for his life. You know, the greatest discovery a person can ever make in their life is knowing what they're created to do. The greatest tragedy is to go through life and not knowing the purpose for which someone was put here. You know, I believe there's three different types of people that live in this world. There's some people who never find their purpose for life. They just kind of drift aimlessly through life. They go to school. They get a job. They change jobs, and they change jobs, and they change jobs. They get married, and then they change spouses, and they change spouses, and they change spouses. They move into this house, they move into that house, they retire, they die, and they never find out what their purpose is for life. That's one type of person. And there's people who, who have the wrong purpose in life. And maybe someone who's like an overachiever, and, and they climb the ladder in, in, in their career. Maybe it's a political ladder or a financial ladder or whatever it is. But they get to the top of the ladder, and they realize they put the ladder against the wrong wall. This is the wrong purpose in life. And then there's the people who find the right purpose in life. They know what they were created for. They believe that God put them on this earth for a reason, that God put them here to fulfill His purpose for their life. And they seek to find out what that purpose is, and they seek to live out that purpose. See, success is finding out what God's will is for your life and obeying God's will for your life, obeying the Word of God. Success in God's eyes has nothing to do with, with all the things of the world of, of possessions and money and fame and fortune and power. Success comes when you do what God has called you to do. That's how God defines success. Let me show, show you just how important this is. Listen again to what God said to Joshua in verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Did you catch what God just said to, Mo, uh, to Joshua? He said, look, if you obey my word, if you'll do my will and fulfill my purpose that I have for you, you'll become an irresistible force. No one can stand against you. You'll be immovable. No one can stand against us when God is standing with us. Nobody can. You know, I believe when you are living out God's will for your life, you will be on this planet until God's will for your life is at the end. No one can take your life if you're doing God's will. You're an indestructible force because you're seeking to be used of God and fulfill the purpose that God has for you. And that is true success. So as we enter this new year, just three days into it, the question is, do we want to be successful? Of course, everybody says that. No one wants to be a failure. But by whose definition of success? And what are we going to do to make sure we are successful by God's definition? Father, thank you for once again reminding us as we begin this new year what is truly important in life. It's not possessions, it's not fame, it's not money, it's not power, but it's being successful in your eyes. Be pleasing to you. And so, Father, as we begin another year that you have given us, Thank you for seeing us through 2023, Lord. Lord, may we honestly evaluate our lives and see how we're seeking to be successful. Because we all want to be successful. The question is how we're doing it and for what definition of success. May it line up with what your word says, Lord. And Lord, we can't do it on our own. We need your help, and you know that. So we're asking you to help us. But may we do what your word says. And this is just part of it that we talked about tonight. But Lord, may we be successful. If you tarry at the end of 2024, may we look back in our lives and say, I sought after God. I did His will. I sought His purpose and fulfilled His purpose. I sought to maintain close fellowship and be pleasing in your eyes with how we live our life this year. Then we'll be successful. And I pray that's our heart's desire. And if not, 
you'll help us get there so we can be successful according to your definition, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.